The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. A new president took the oath of office on the steps of the U.S. Capitol yesterday. Tonight, renowned American political scientist Francis Fukuyama is with us on what it will take for that country to, as Joe Biden put it, end this uncivil war. Then, a week into Ontario's second state of emergency, Nan Kiwanuka looks at how promises for enhanced policing and enforcement of public health guidelines have gone so far. It's Thursday, January 21st, and that's next on The Agenda. Donald Trump lost. Joe Biden won. That is now an unalterable fact proven by the peaceful transition of power that took place in the United States yesterday. Does it mean that country is out of the woods or that American democracy is back on track, even as millions who voted for Trump still don't accept the outcome of the election as free and fair? Francis Fukuyama has reminded us in his many books and essays that liberal democracy faces an ongoing struggle between its liberal and democratic components. He is senior fellow at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and director of their Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. And he joins us now from Palo Alto, California. It's great to see you again, Professor. How are you doing? Very good. Thanks for having me on again, Steve. Not at all. You have said that the 2020 election just completed was the most important election of your life. And I checked, you've been alive for every election since Dwight Eisenhower's first. <laughs> so what was on the line had Trump won, in your view? Well, I think that the issue really was democracy itself. I mean, many people uh, critical of Trump felt that, that you may disagree with particular policies on immigration or trade, but he represented a much deeper threat to the basic institutions, uh, most importantly, the rule of law itself. Uh, I think this was a pattern that he established when he was still a businessman, where he simply saw the law as a useful weapon that he could use against his enemies, but that it shouldn't apply to himself. Uh, and then, as we saw uh, in his actions after the election on November 3rd, uh, he seemed to also have contempt for, you know, the electoral process itself, which was one of the most fundamental uh, foundations of the rule of law in the United States. And so I think that's really the issue that was the most important. There are a number of Republicans that continue to say, well, yes, but he still got us good Supreme Court justices and so forth. But I think that completely overlooks you know, the much, much deeper threat that he represented. Well, we, rem we well remember, rather, four years ago yesterday that that right from the very outset, his press secretary came to the podium and said that was the largest group of people ever to see an inauguration in American history, which was a provably false statement, but he said it anyway. Uh, we certainly do know that the crowd on hand for Joe Biden's inauguration may have been one of the smallest ever for obvious reasons. Mind you, there were 25,000 National Guard on hand as well. <laughs> and I guess I'd like you to sort of weigh in on the symbolism to be read into all of that. Well, I think that um, the most important aspect of the inauguration was what was said and not, uh, not the crowd size. And I think that what people were impressed with was the overwhelming normalcy of the, um, of the event, that it uh, continued the various traditions. Uh, it was a terrific contrast to those scenes of the rioters that had taken over the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, I, noted in particular when Lady Gaga was singing the national anthem and she got to the line and our flag is still there. She turned and pointed to the flag that was flying over the Capitol uh, to symbolize the fact that, you know, uh, serious people had retaken uh, that particular institution. Uh, and so I think that was really the, the significance. Uh, you know, all politicians uh, spin and and shade the news in different ways, but 
Trump was just completely different. I mean, the scale of his lying was just so monumental that it was like nothing anyone had seen before. And I think that, you know, that's one of the things that uh, this inauguration has symbolized is that we're not going to have to wake up every morning to, you know, to face yet another big lie about some important subject. Well, having said that, let me remind you that 40 percent of Americans surveyed think Donald Trump was still a pretty good president. They approved of his job. And according to a Pew poll taken right after the riot on the 6th of January, 57 percent of Republicans still want Donald Trump to play a significant role in the national affairs of your country going forward. It looks like he's still got a grasp on a big chunk of your fellow countrymen and women. Would you not agree that's the case? No, it's uh, it's the case, although there's going to be a big fight within the Republican Party. It's started already. Uh, the now minority leader of the party, Mitch McConnell, uh, made a, a speech a couple days ago where he pretty clearly attacked Donald Trump. Uh, I think that he would not... Um, be doing that if he didn't think that he got he had a, a significant number of Republican Senate votes uh, to actually impeach Trump. Uh, so we'll have to see how that plays out. But you're right that you know the problem in the Republican Party is not at the moment the elites. They've been too timid and uh, you know weak need to stand up to Trump, and that's been a problem. But the problem is the grassroots. The problem is all those. Republican voters out there that are willing to punish anybody that goes against Trump. And I would add another statistic to the ones that you just mentioned, which is that by one poll, something like a third of Republican voters believe some version of the QAnon conspiracy theory, right, that uh, the Democrats are drinking children's blood in tunnels under Washington and, and this sort of thing. And so the, you know, the craziness has, has I just think, reached a a really different point uh, within that party right now. And uh, it's going to be, you know, one of the first orders of business to try to purge that from, uh, you know, from the body politic. No, for sure. There's the kind of Mitt Romney, Lisa Murkowski, Mitch McConnell, let's call it the sane wing of the Republican Party. But there still is this this other group that will follow Trump anywhere. And as he himself said, the movement we've started is just beginning. And at his farewell address at um, Joint Forces Base Andrews, uh, he did say, you watch, I'll be back. I don't really know how yet, but I'm coming back. I mean, what are you reading mm -hmm. into that? Well, he's certainly going to try, and there's certainly a lot of people in the country that are going to want him to do that. Uh, but I do think that you know, actually being president and exercising presidential powers is really pretty, uh, you know, pretty important. And Trump simply does not have that platform anymore. Uh, and he does now have pretty open enemies within the party. You know, he's talked about forming a third party patriot party uh, uh, to break away from the Republicans. I actually hope he does that uh, because that's a guarantee of fading into insignificance because, um, for better or, or worse, our first-past-the-post electoral system does not reward third parties. Uh, but I do think that the fact that he's even thinking about this, you know, indicates that he feels that he's lost an important part of the, you know, the former mainstream Republican base. And that, uh, you know, that's an important development. I wonder if your greatest fear, though, in those circumstances is that the Democratic Party is over here, the kind of sane Republican Party then becomes that minority third party, and the Trumpist wing of what was the Republican Party becomes the official opposition because that's the bigger chunk of people. You concerned about that? Well, well, uh, you know, in a way, I think it could work out well because I think that those moderate um, Republicans like Mitt Romney or Murkowski or Susan Collins, uh, uh, you know, there's a, a number of them, could actually end up caucusing with the Democrats. Uh, the Democrats have a very, very tenuous uh, majority right now. It's only you know 50 Senate seats plus the vice president. And uh, those centrists will actually be really critical. And in many pieces of legislation, you know, their votes may be uh, very important. So although there's no I think, possibility of them breaking off and forming a third party. I do think they're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to continue to be pretty influential um, in the Congress that uh, Joe Biden has to deal with. 
Let me read something from David Brooks writing in the New York Times last week where he said, one core feature of Trumpism is that it forces you to betray every other commitment you might have to the truth, moral character, the Sermon on the Mount, conservative principles, the Constitution. You know, I presume this sort of gets at what you're, you've often referred to as the, um, you know, all of us living in parallel information universes. I don't know how we get out of those parallel information universes where one seems rooted in empirically provable facts and the other is rooted in disinformation, miasma, call it what you will. Have you got any thoughts on that? Uh, sure. So I think that the Brooks quote reflects, you know, this evolution within the Republican Party where it's completely unmoored from policy issues, right? What used to divide Republicans and Democrats were differences of opinion on the budget, on taxes, on immigration, on, you know, uh, tariffs, on all sorts of things. Uh, but now, increasingly, it evolved into a cult of personality surrounding Donald Trump, and that was really symbolized by the fact that the Republican uh, uh, Republicans at their convention last year uh, said that they weren't going to write a platform uh, which is the typical way to outline what your policy positions are. They said, our platform is simply whatever Donald Trump wants. And, uh, you know, honestly, since November 3rd, that uh, test of loyalty to Trump has become the standard for what it means to be a Republican, uh, is whether you support, you know, the most outlandish uh, conspiracy nonsense that he spouts, and that makes you, you know, that makes you a Republican. But that also, I think, suggests that this is a dead end, and I think this is why McConnell and a lot of the other uh, centrist Republicans are getting off the boat, because they actually do believe that there are certain policies that they want to um, enact. Uh, Trump presided over the loss of the presidency and the loss of both houses of Congress. And I think, you know, a Republican that actually cares about some underlying issues has got to start thinking, well, maybe a party built around one individual and his, you know, crazy opinions may be a kind of dead end. And we need to think about how we're going to get back into power uh, in 2022 and 2024. Uh, so that you know, suggest at least one path uh, of getting out of this, um, this situation. One wonders, though, whether it's possible to have a healthy democracy if both sides, never mind disagree, of course disagreement is perfectly wonderful, but if, if it's gone from that to, I not only disagree with you, I think you're evil and I think you're irredeemably stupid and I have nothing to say to you. And both sides seem to feel that way about each other right now. Can you have healthy democracy under those conditions? Well, no, that's uh, uh, obviously not the case. Uh, this is what political scientists call effective polarization, where you just you disagree not just on issues, but you actually hate the other side and think they're treasonous and uh, and the like. Uh, so that's something that you know needs to be overcome. It's not going to be easy to do. I think. Biden is probably the one politician in the United States that has a good chance of trying to fix that. But honestly, uh, it's going to be the work of, of years, uh, you know, if not, uh, uh, if not decades to overcome. I read from David Brooks earlier, and now I'm going to read from somebody else whose name is Francis Fukuyama. You may have heard of him. He's pretty good. Uh, he writes in American Purpose, the contemporary attack on liberalism goes much deeper than the ambitions of a handful of populist politicians, however. They would not be as successful as they have been were they not riding a wave of discontent with some of the underlying characteristics of liberal societies. Help us out. What are those characteristics? Well, I think that uh, there are problems in the way liberalism developed, both on the right and the left. On the, on the right, uh, you know, liberal economic policies, uh, economic freedom evolved into what's been called neoliberalism beginning in the 1980s with the rise of uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, and Ronald Reagan, where uh, free markets were worshipped in, in a way as an end in themselves. And I think that had a big uh, impact on increasing uh, inequality within every liberal society, uh, beginning with the United States. And that's what's really, I think, created a lot of the economic uh, discontent that we see uh, in front of us. On the left, I think you've seen the um, evolution of 
another kind of extreme form of uh, liberalism, uh, which takes the form of identity politics, where the issue is not so much economic freedom, but personal autonomy, uh, where groups, you know, rightly feel that they've been marginalized and want to be excluded. But what's happened is that it's evolved into, you know, a critique of uh, sort of the universal human rights ideals of uh, uh, liberals to begin with, saying that, no, actually, we're not the same as you. Uh, you know, if you're a minority, you know, female, you've got a very different set of lived experiences. You can't possibly understand who I am. Uh, and therefore, there's really very no, there's really a, a great difficulty in communicating across those divides. Uh, and I think that, you know, that then leads to a discontent with liberal uh, methods of deliberation, the slowness of uh, liberal democracies to address social justice issues. And so that's what I think has evolved into a sort of intolerance that you see, you know, it's largely confined at the moment to cultural institutions, uh, universities and Hollywood and, and places like that. But I think, you know, that uh, represents a re rejection of certain liberal values on the left. Uh, now, I will be the first to say I don't believe that these are symmetric. Uh, I don't think these are equal threats because we've just come through a four-year period in which the anti-liberal right has actually held uh, political power and has done a lot of damage in the way that it's exercised that power. But, you know, there's, there's going to be, there is an ongoing problem, I think, on the other side as well that um, we're going to have to deal with in the coming years. You just used an expression that people freely use, uh, routinely use, uh, liberal democracy. And I, I want to just follow up on that because we all use those words together as if they're meant to be together. Do they? Should, I mean, are they meant to be together? Uh, well, they work well together when they're interpreted properly, but they are very different uh, phenomena. You know, democracy really has to do with popular choice as expressed through free and fair multi-party elections. Liberalism is really built around the rule of law. It's a set of rules that constrain power through constitutions, through checks and balances, through rules that make it impossible for uh, an executive, uh, you know, the prime minister or the, the president to do whatever he or she wants. Uh, they have to operate according to these constraints, these prior constraints. And sometimes these help one another. Um, I think that, you know, democracy supported the rule of law, let's say, in the Nixon um, Watergate scandals where Congress really pushed for the law to be uh, applied. But sometimes they work at cross purposes, and you've seen the rise of populist parties in many countries where an elected official has used their mandate to basically undermine the rule of law. I mean, this happened really in Hungary very early on with the rise of Viktor Orban, who then uh, tried to cripple the court system, fill it with, you know, his own uh, cronies, uh, uh, capture the media. And Donald Trump, you know, did exactly the same thing. He has basically been waging a four-year war on American institutions, attacking the mainstream media as enemies of the American people, attacking the intelligence community, his own bureaucracy, the FBI, uh, essentially anything that got in his way. Uh, and, you know, this is really what's gotten him impeached twice now is his complete failure to respect the liberal uh, aspects of American liberal democracy as opposed to the purely democratic aspects. Well, we have certainly seen the concerning incursion of illiberal democracies. You mentioned Hungary, Poland is out there as well, and others. Are there examples of regimes in this world which are liberal but not democratic? Well, sure. Uh, I think that, you know, the classic ones are probably historical because Europe liberalized before uh, it democratized. So Germany in the 19th century was a liberal state. It had a strong rule of law, but it was very autocratic. Today, uh, people, I think, point to some a place like Singapore as a country that actually inherited common law from the British Empire. Uh, you know, you can be pretty secure in your rights uh, as a as a Singaporean citizen, but they have very uh, unfair elections. There's no level playing field, although they do hold uh, elections. 
Um, so there are not many contemporary examples of this. I think Hong Kong is something that people would have pointed to, but unfortunately, uh, neither liberalism nor democracy really prevails, you know, in that territory after what uh, 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 Beijing has done to it. I don't want to oversimplify matters here, but let me throw, humor me for a second and let me throw this out here and you tell me what you think. Is it the case that for liberal democracies to work in this world, well-educated liberals have got to stop lording it over less educated everyday people and everyday people have got to stop being objecting to being governed by people who have better credentials and experience at that kind of thing than they do because they know their stuff. Does that, does that equation make sense? Uh, yes, properly interpreted. So I think it's certainly the case that there's a huge amount of resentment against the kinds of educated elites that have governed the country. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, we've kind of worshipped meritocracy and credentials in ways that I think have been very damaging. You know, parents in this country, and living in Palo Alto, I mean, this is a prime example of it. You know, parents uh, spend all of this money making sure that their kids get into an elite college, marry somebody else from an elite college. And in a way, those advantages that come from that kind of education uh, are passed down to their children. And uh, if you come from a working class family, your opportunities are much more limited. And there's a cultural, uh, I think, contempt. Uh, since 2016, everybody claims that they're trying to get over that, but I think you can still see it, you know, very, um, very clearly in the society. On the other side, you know, I think this idea that you can do without expertise and professional judgment and, you know, education is just a myth. Uh, all societies have elites; uh, they need elites. And in fact, if you think about East Asia. Uh, you know, it's been a very successful area. It's the one non-Western part of the world that has developed uh, economically in a very powerful way. It's also, in the last year, the one area of the world that's done the best in controlling uh, the COVID epidemic. And one of the reasons for that is that there's this deep-seated Confucian tradition of respect for education and expertise. And so, you know, I I've had the experience of being in China and being told by uh, friends there. Well, you know, people in the government are pretty smart. They know what they're doing. And so I think we ought to listen to them. You know, and <laughs> what's the last time you ever heard an American say anything like that? Uh, so I do think that, you know, it, that general attitude of, you know, a certain amount of deference to uh, uh, experts is, is actually helpful and necessary. But Experts also screw up. They screw up big time in, you know, in many cases. And so that's why I don't think that government by technocrats is ever going to be you know, the answer to uh, the problem of governance in general. It was the best and the brightest that got your country into the Vietnam miasma after all, right? Well, not just Vietnam, but the financial crisis in 2008, the Iraq war. I mean, all of these things were supported by people with really great credentials that you know, made very, very big mistakes. In our last couple of minutes here, I do want to ask you, and, and you know, I think most people who were looking for a more normal America, if I can put it that way, uh, were heartened by what they saw yesterday uh, at 12 noon on the Capitol steps. Having said that, <laughs> you know, your country's a long way from out of the woods yet. So, if American democracy were to fail, what impact do you think that would have on other democracies around the world? Well, I think it's already had a big impact. I mean, the fact that America abdicated its leadership has given great encouragement to uh, authoritarian great powers like Russia and China. Uh, I think they've been both chortling in Moscow and Beijing over, you know, the January 6th events. I think it's been very discouraging to activists all over the uh, world who are fighting for democracy because they've not gotten support from the United States. But I think the single most uh, damaging thing is just the, the the tarnishing of the brand name and the American model. Uh, I used to have Chinese students, you know, 15, 20 years ago that studied in the United States and they'd say, well, we want uh, China to look like the United States in the way that, you know, it's, it's practices democracy down the road. 
and nobody says that anymore you know you want a bunch of you want a, a crazed mob uh, attacking your own legislature you know this is not uh, this is not a model that is going to be held up to anybody and so i think uh, it's going to take a good deal of effort to recover that uh, authority and prestige that america once enjoyed we still want you to be that shining city on the hill eh <laughs> that's right uh no i think that it's you know it's a good thing because it does give people a, a model for uh what a democratic government ought to be uh and because america has been powerful and rich uh that example uh you know plays out in many different parts of the world but it hasn't been doing that for for some time now francis fukuyama we always enjoy your appearances on our program thanks again for making some time for us okay thank you very much steve you be well and stay safe. Okay, you too. And we hope this conversation has whetted your appetite for more on democracy, because just a reminder that tomorrow we will return to these topics as part of our new series, The Democracy Agenda. It's a joint initiative between TVO and the Toronto Star. So stay tuned. Tomorrow on The Agenda. Everybody is feeling the strain of changes in economic life and not knowing what to do for it. And if we don't address it without talking about race, but talking about rejuvenating the economy, whatever that takes to do it in a way that's constructive, we will not save America. American democracy will not survive. That's tomorrow on the agenda. When the current state of emergency in Ontario was announced earlier this month, the province pledged that, quote, strong new measures will be enforced. What that meant exactly was not clear then. Now that we're a week into it, have the expectations of police and their enforcement rule become more clear? Let's ask. In Burlington, Ontario, Scott Mills, Strategic Communications Coordinator for Ontario Provincial Police Association. In Ajax, Ontario, Kanika Samuels-Wortley, Assistant Professor at Carleton University's Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice. And in the provincial capital, Dr. Nahid Dosani, a palliative care physician, health justice activist, and professor at McMaster University in Hamilton. And Abby Deshman, Criminal Justice Program Manager at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Hi to you all. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I know you are all very busy, uh, and we appreciate your time. Um, I want to set the table of our conversation by basically asking you all the same question. Scott, I want to start with you. When the Ontario government announced its latest stay-at-home messaging, uh, what were your initial thoughts, Scott? My initial thoughts is uh, we were going to have to stay in our houses and uh, um, basically uh, uh, live at home and... Uh, that was basically it. Um, I, I I felt like it was uh, um, the situation had gone to a point where there was some really serious uh, um, orders from the government that were coming down. Were you surprised to hear that the police will be involved in enforcing those stay-at-home orders? Uh, no, I wasn't surprised. Um, that's what that's what law enforcement does uh, day in and day out is uh, um, police uh, the laws that the that the government makes. And Kanika, what how did you interpret the latest uh, stay at home measure when you first heard it over a week ago? Well, I found that the rules were a bit confusing. We weren't sure. Uh, we had figured that we were in a, a lockdown, so it 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 didn't. Uh, makes sense that we had a, a additional measures, which I think most of us thought we already were going through. So with rules that uh, are, are quite uh, confusing and, and continue to be confusing for the general citizen, I, I just can only imagine for uh, police as well that that allows a level of confusion. And uh, that, that potentially, and without kind of formal criteria to what uh, should be implemented and, and, and the particular measures and the particular individuals who should be stopped, and questioned and potentially fined, um, it, it, it opens doors for a level of inconsistencies and, and, and discretions that, uh, that might be problematic. And uh, so it, it, it really is quite confusing as to um, what, what can be done, what we can do. And I, I suspect it's the same for police services as well. And Dr. Dasani, what was your impression? 
you know, as a science and evidence-based um, health worker who wants to bring an end to COVID-19, I, I saw the merits of a stay-at-home order and um, and people, um, you know, seeing the merits of this kind of uh, state of emergency. But as a physician and health worker who provides health care for racialized communities, often low-income racialized people, my mind went to a totally different place about um, what over-policing has done to the people I care for, for Black and Indigenous people, for other racialized people in our communities. And um, there is a long-standing history of over-policing in low-income racialized neighborhoods where many of our essential workers live and work. Uh, we know that this is not an equal opportunity virus. Um, in the first wave, 83% of people in the Toronto area that were affected were racialized people. We know that policing is not an equal opportunity experience. Racialized people are over-targeted and over-profiled. And um, it, it, given the confusion that even police leaders were stating um, the day after, um, this was not a good combination of things. And so I continue to be concerned about over-policing and, you know, I'm worried that we are returning to policing in a pandemic, which I appreciate there needs to be an element of that, but we can't police our way to back to public health and we can't police our way out of this pandemic. And Abby, what were your impressions? So very similar um, uh, concerns and eager to see the legal details, right? Often we get uh, the political communication announcements first, uh, the regulations and legal details follow. And as a lawyer, I always want to see the actual law. And um, the message stay at home is very simple, uh, very compelling. Uh, actually doing that is very complex. There are all kinds of people that need to leave their houses for many, many, many reasons. And figuring out exactly what those details are, what the law says, um, and if there is scope and space for you know, the people who don't have a safe home, the people who who are living on the streets, the, the people that are essential workers, the people who need to travel to get their kids to and from childcare um, or other family members. Life is complex and uh, it's often in the minor details of the law that um, we really know how these orders are going to impact people and, and whether there will be disproportionate um, and ultimately discriminatory policing um, that follows. And Scott, um, you know, you are uh, representing the police, and I don't want you to feel as if we're uh, putting all of this on you. We wanted you to be on the show because we really do want to get an, an idea and understanding of what is happening, because when the um, Premier announced these stay-at-home orders, we kept hearing, you know, if it's an essential trip, you can make that essential trip. But there was no clear definition of what essential was. And you've heard some of the guests say uh, it was confusing, and we've been hearing that from people who uh, watch to show that this is very confusing. You, the police, also um, have had um, people call 911 asking um, what the message meant. So um, have the police been left to decide for citizens what an essential outing is? Well, it, it is clearly defined in the, in, in the order. And um, I think it, it was just a matter of getting it communicated out there. And uh, everything in, in COVID uh, happens fast. And, and there's a lot of change. And it's quite understandable that uh, that people don't know uh, up from down these days. Um, you know, including sometimes the the police officers that are uh, out there uh, tasked to enforce, and the bylaw officers. Um, keep in mind, we're all human beings too in law enforcement. Uh, we all have families. Um, we're all living through this as well. Um, a police officer or a, law, a bylaw officer, the last thing they want to do is go out and and cause misery to uh, add misery to a to an open wound. Uh, we're all suffering uh, at this time, um, and uh, but th there has to be an enforcement um, aspect to any law that, that that's implemented. Um, so I I just I uh, I hear what what the other uh, people. Uh, guests that you have here are saying and and I think it's important to acknowledge what they're saying and, and not dismiss what's being said in any way shape or form um, uh, but I think that it everything that I'm seeing on the law enforcement and there's trying to be a measured response and there's trying to be um, uh, a response that's reflective of the need, yet at the same time um, is not going out to target uh, specific communities or, or anything like that. I haven't seen anything like that. I haven't heard of anything like that happening. Um, 
the government, I believe, is trying to target the behavior of gatherings and, and getting together. And, and their goal is an admirable goal, and it's to stop the spread of COVID-19 and keep us alive. Some people don't want to listen to that, and that's where the enforcement piece comes in. I just want to clear, um, because you said that um, it's pretty clear the essential part of it, but there are people who are uh, frontline workers. Um, when we say stay at home, um, there's a lot of people, I guess, in this context, it is a privilege to be able to stay home and do your job at home. Um, but there's a lot of people who were working, who are working on the front lines who have to go into work. And we've been reading articles and seeing studies come out. It's affecting uh, certain communities. Do you think, though, that maybe the government should have been more clear as to what an essential trip means? Scott? Um, well, it, it, it's hard to say. I think, I think if, you, if you actually look at the legislation, um, it, it, it is pretty clear um, about um, what can and can't be done. And it is reasonable. Um, there are exceptions for people's daily lives um, that are basically common sense of, uh, uh, exceptions. So I, I really think that we have to look at this in terms of common sense, in terms of this is a temporary uh, measure. Um, it, it's We all need to do our part. And um, uh, the, the police are in it with the community uh, the law enforcement officers are with our community. We are part of our community. We don't want this to go on any more than anybody else. And um, please work with us. Um, we don't want to put ourselves at risk um, enforcing uh, this type of thing. Um, so the more that we have compliance and uh, um, communication about what's reasonable and what's happening, uh, the better. Uh, police aren't knocking on your door and, and, and dragging you out of your house for breaking rules. That's not happening. Um, uh, Dr. Dasani, I want to pose this question to you. Scott says that it is clear as to what essential, uh, what the stay-at-home order is. What do you think are the gaps in the public's understanding of the order? Because it does seem that there is some confusion. Well, I mean, I think just to respond to some of the comments, we must remember that the notion that policing impacts our communities equally is just simply not true. Um, we, I live in a city where black people are 20 times more likely to be shot. Um, that's that's deadly force. There's there's a history of profiling. We have a history of carding on the basis of poverty. We live in a province and country where the criminalization of people experiencing homelessness is very real. I'm a doctor who pr provides health care for people experiencing homelessness. The people I care for experience that. We have a a history of criminalizing communicable disease. Just ask people who have uh, uh, who deal with HIV. So you know, staying at home is a privilege, and what's lacking in the communication is the nuanced approach of, of the experience of those who don't have that privilege. The people who don't have a home, people who don't have money in their bank account, account, people who don't have caregivers to support them. And so when our politicians say that, we lack that understanding, and our essential workers are dealing with that. So in our communications approach, a lot of the time. Th things are communicated in documents that are online or at press conferences in the middle of the day where many people, essential workers, the racialized people, low-income workers are typically at work. They don't consume information that way. We have we have had a one-size-fits-all approach to communication for too long in this pandemic, and we are not um, approaching this in a, in, a, in a health literate way for people who may not have that literacy. We're not thinking about different languages. We're not thinking about different media and social media platforms. Many of the racialized people I care for in the South Asian community get their information from WhatsApp or other social media platforms. And that's why I'm so proud of colleagues at organizations like the South Asian Health Network who have, who have come together to create communications for these communities. But why does it take community advocates to do this? Our governments need to step up and provide more equitable approaches to communication. Um, Kanika, do you think that, what do you think the public should know about what the police can or cannot do in this current stay-at-home order. I I would actually leave it to my colleague to uh, to to answer to what uh, the public should expect or what they can and cannot do when they encounter police. I I simply wanted to respond to my colleague in terms of how uh, police uh, surveillance and attention tends to uh, be on 
Black, Indigenous, and, and, and racialized communities. And the fear with these increased orders and this increased police powers is that this is simply giving another tool in, in, in the police officer's toolbox to randomly stop an individual in, in the name of public health orders. Um, so we are afraid that history is going to continue to repeat itself. Um, so even though... Um, the police are not on, are not supposed to stop you um, randomly uh, uh, without cause. There there is now this opportunity to use a public health order in order to do that. Um, however, I would leave it to my colleague Abby to to answer to um, what it is and and what are the rights of an individual who is stopped by police. Abby, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, the baseline uh, for everybody is that you do not have to talk to the police. Uh, constitutional rights uh, are still in force and you have the right to silence. Um, having said that, though, you know, we do have uh, increased police powers that have come with COVID uh, as a consequence of COVID emergency orders. So if a police officer um, has reasonable and probable grounds to believe that you are in violation of one of the COVID orders, they can demand you that you identify yourself. Um, and you know, that does mean uh, usually either saying your name, your address, date of birth. Um, we've definitely heard from people that they have been told they need to produce identification. Uh, if they don't have it, they've been asked to phone a family member, uh, get a text fixture of um, their ID at home. So these are increased police powers. And I think the concern is uh, police are not in uniform contact with uh, people in my city across the province, right? We do have greatly increased um, police contact with racialized people, uh, black individuals, indigenous people, people living on the streets. So when you layer these additional uh, powers, these additional um, orders uh, on top, and, and the police are going to be primarily enforcing them in the context of their current policing duties, it, those policing duties disproportionately burden certain communities. And the real risk um, is that these COVID orders will also disproportionately burden black uh, racialized communities. So, um, and from our perspective, you know, it is a hard ask for police. Uh, we actually don't think it's um, a very useful ask for police uh, to try to enforce our way out of a pandemic. Um, how should we the approach it then? Not to interrupt you, but how should we approach this? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, we have examples of jurisdictions in Canada that did not rely on enforcement um, in the first wave of COVID and very effectively flattened the curve. Uh, BC uh, issued very, very few, few tickets. Um, in fact, they specifically told their um, law enforcement police officers, bylaw officers, that they were not to be involved in the policing of the public health orders. Education. It is about supports. It is about things like, you know, do you have sick days that you can take that are paid? Are you worried about you know, your job still existing um, if you take two weeks off to self-isolate? What are your childcare options? Really looking at the supports that people have in order to comply with very difficult uh, public health recommendations and orders, rather than relying on punitive tools like enforcement uh, and fines and punishment. Um, and I think it, that's a hard message for people to understand. Lots of people intuitively think, you know, if we put out rules and then we follow them up with punishments, that's going to ensure compliance. And the truth is, um, people's lives are much more complicated than that. Um, and changing the human behavior uh, doesn't really work that way. Well, the province has said that this is now the law. And Dr. Dasani, um, I noticed you wanted to jump in. Yeah, you know, I really agree with those um, statements. I think it's really um, it's really um, uh, understandable that people in the public might say, okay, just stay at home and we need more law enforcement. But what we're lacking and why I'm so disappointed in the government's response up until this point and why we're not seeing case counts drop in the way we're hoping is because we're not addressing the social underpinnings of what are causing more COVID-19 cases in our communities. And that is a significant proportion of cases coming from our essential workers who are simply going to work and have to choose between going to work and paying their bills and their health. And it is so disappointing to see that despite activists, um, health professionals, and a concerned public asking our province for paid sick leave, that we continue to get gaslighted about the idea that 
that paid sick leave is a federal responsibility. We all know that the federal program for paid sick leave doesn't pay out the same way. It doesn't pay out in the same amount, and there are significant delays in payment. So it's a higher threshold and barrier that many people just can't use. It also requires you to take more than 50% of the week off for work to get access to, and that doesn't really work for those who just need to take a day to be sick or go get a COVID test. So, you know, paid sick leave, decent wages, and workplace protections are so important. We live in a province where over 7,600 cases have happened in um, factories, production plants, um, and up until recently, we only had one employer fined. Where is the accountability on employers? And I do understand inspections are happening more. And see, we're getting at the social underpinnings of health inequities that are leading to more COVID-19 cases. And so law enforcement is just a superficial kind of discussion. We need to be digging at the roots. Um, and Scott, you know, earlier on, uh, I don't know if I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to what Dr. Dazasani said. Um, is it superficial? It's it's not. I don't want to dismiss what anybody's saying because because everybody has a viewpoint and, and their viewpoints need to be listened to and respected. Um, that includes that includes the police, and I think the police um, get get painted with a large brush here. Um, we're, we're we're just a, um, a minor element in this entire big picture of, of the COVID situation. And there are a lot of us out there in law enforcement that are working very, very hard to help people in need. Um, you know, and I don't think anyone, uh, Scott, I don't think anyone is disputing it. Um, earlier on, yeah. you said that this is about uh, making sure uh, you break up uh, public gatherings. But this past, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, anti-mask uh, protesters, especially like this past week in, uh, in Toronto. Um, and we saw them breaking the order in a very public manner. Um, but then we've also heard reports that um, a mother of four uh, being stopped and being fined, and I, I believe her fine was $880, and she was fined for bringing her kids to their grandparents for babysitting. Isn't that just poor, like extremely bad optics for the police? Um, I, I'm told there, there's always, I think we have to very much keep it in perspective that there's always two stories. Uh, two sides to every story, and then there's the truth. And um, I think um, some things make it into the media and be and become an issue, uh, like the issue that you're re you're referring to. And I think there is more to the story um, that isn't being reported on. You know, the, these these. These are tickets. These are uh, these are like getting a, a speeding ticket. They're provincial offense act matters, and and generally, um, police communications uh, don't comment and identify people to the media um, on provincial offense act matters. They're not criminal matters, right? So, but people did see. I um, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, though. Um, people did see the anti-mask uh, protesters and the police. Um, at the end of, uh, I think the next day, they did say that they gave out tickets. The number of tickets, I don't know if they added up to the amount of people who were uh, at the protest. Um, I, a lot of politicians have been uh, challenged with the messaging uh, behind the pandemic, and trust has come up a lot. Do you think that maybe this is more of a trust uh, issue between the public and the police? Um, I. For for certain people, there's always a trust issue between the public and the police. For others, there isn't. It, it, it's very subjective about about who you are and what your situation is. Uh, in relation to the anti-maskers, um, the rules are in place to stop that type of thing. It's it's uh, police officers and and bylaw officers and anybody doing enforcement at an anti-masker protest are putting themselves at risk. Um, th these people should be looked at, uh, looked upon as 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 community heroes, trying to keep us safe, um, not uh, not in a light of of they're coming to racially profile us at an anti mass demonstration. Um, the police are really uh, looking at the behavior; um, they're not looking at people's skin color in relation to this. The police don't want to be out there having to do this job any more than anybody else does during these times. And um, I just hope that that um, 
that that issues aren't getting conflated. Um, this is a temporary measure. Uh, the police have been asked to do enforcement. Um, they're doing the best job that they can given the circumstances and limited resources. Um, and we're all trying to keep ourselves safe. And if I could just make a, a, a plea for calm and, and not to conflate issues, um, I think I think most law enforcement people would, would want that to be said. Can you explain the four E's of uh, engage, explain, educate, enforce of policing, uh, what you're generally using in a police stop situation? So, so the police aren't, aren't stopping um, people in cars to enforce these orders. That's, that woman, that's the mother, not, um, not to interrupt again, but that mother says that she was stopped by the police when she was in a car. So would you, would you, would you, would you agree that maybe some of this stuff is happening? Anything, anything is possible. And uh, I, I don't want to dismiss anybody's viewpoint. Uh, anything is possible. I wasn't at that situation. I don't, I haven't been briefed fully on that situation. I just uh, want people to um, understand that, that there's always more than one side to any story. Abby? So there are lots of ways that the police um, have to stop cars, right? Even outside of the COVID orders, um, police have a really broad authority to stop a car, ask a driver for a license um, and identification. So uh, this is, it could be, you know, police making a lawful stop under the Highway Traffic Act and then also inquiring about COVID tests. This is, you know, one of the ways that these orders can get layered on top of existing police powers. And um, there was another uh, media release um, that went out, uh, said a uh, police service stopped a suspicious car uh, with no explanation of what suspicious meant. And then they asked more questions of the passengers. Passengers identified themselves. They ended up getting um, COVID-related fines and no other charges, right? This is one of, uh, you know, the ways that these fines can be layered on top of existing police patterns, existing police powers, um, and disproportionately impact um, the same people who are disproportionately policed right now. But I, I do want to say that I think actually the approach to enforcement in Ontario um, has um, been restrained in comparison to, uh, for example, Quebec, right? I, I think it was very useful to um, have the clarification that police would not have the power to stop people um, in cars solely to check um, if they are violating COVID orders, would not have the ability to uh, demand uh, justifications from people as to why they are out and about. Um, people would not be required to have notes from uh, healthcare providers or their employers. Those were very useful clarifications. And I I think we've seen a different approach in Quebec, frankly, um, where there is a curfew uh, and the premier there is saying, you know, yeah, homeless people need to, uh, people experiencing homelessness need to abide by the curfew. Um, and we have had reports of people uh, with no safe place to go um, being fined uh, very, very steep fines. I mean, that is um, a really unhelpful approach. And I I'm glad uh, that we haven't seen that um, in Ontario. And I, I I think that's something that um, we should be thankful for. Uh, Kanika, what should someone do if they feel like they're being unfairly fined or, or charged? See, that's that's um, kind of an I issue at hand right now when we speak to um, accountability. Um, at the moment, when an individual feels that they have been um, mistreated uh, by the police, there is very little that... Um, that they have um, recourse or that they have for them because they essentially have to go to the police to make a complaint against the police. Um, so in this instance, uh, uh, sorry, again, I'm going to have to leave that to Abby as, as she would be uh, better suited to answer as to what is available to um, citizens who feel that they have been mistreated by police. But at the current moment, there really doesn't seem to be um, much of an opportunity for a citizen to, to state uh, or, or to have that um, opportunity to make that complaint uh, simply because you're complaining to the police. Um, and, and, and generally, uh, there, there does not tend to be uh, a great deal of accountability 
uh, when a citizen comes to complain against uh, the police themselves. Uh, so, Abby, I'll ask you the same question. Uh, what should someone do if they feel like they are being unfairly fined or charged? Yeah, so people have the right to contest these tickets. Um, and certainly during the first wave of COVID, we um, were in touch with dozens and dozens of people who were ticketed, um, you know, when their kid ran and jumped up on a park bench uh, or um, because they were standing one foot inside of a unmarked uh, soccer field, right? So lots of people felt um, that they had uh, been unfairly targeted or received very, um, uh, you know, really unrelated tickets that were unrelated to public health goals. Um, people have the right to contest those tickets. Um, right now, I haven't heard of anybody actually getting a trial date. Things are very, very backlogged um, in the justice system. But these tickets are more akin to speeding tickets than they are to, you know, criminal code offenses. Um, you'll probably be able to find a, a neighbor or a family member that's thought about contesting a speeding ticket. Um, certainly, you can get in touch with the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. We have a forum up on our website to try and keep track of how these tickets are playing out. Um, and eventually, uh, there will be an opportunity um, for you to go and explain the circumstances circumstances um, and why you think that the particular ticket was unfair. Um, I, I cannot believe it, but uh, we've run out of time. <laughs> I think we have to pick up this conversation uh, soon, and we really do appreciate your time. I know you're all very busy. Thank you so much for joining us on the agenda tonight. Thank you Thank very you much. for having us. And that is the agenda for Thursday, January 21st, 2021. Lincoln Alexander Day in Canada. Link was the country's first black MP, the first black cabinet minister, and Ontario's first black lieutenant governor. He was a pioneer and he was from Hamilton. Now, tomorrow, we're launching a new initiative in partnership with the Toronto Star, addressing some of the most pressing issues of our time. It's called the Democracy Agenda. And we hope you'll tune in for the first of many conversations we'll have aimed at understanding and reviving the democratic tradition. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. And we'll see you here again tomorrow for our first Democracy Agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.